to open up to Ephesians chapter 6. Ephesians chapter 6. And we're going to be in verse uh, 10 to 12. We'll start off there. Ephesians 6, 10 to 12, and I'll open up in a word of prayer. But before I do that, I want to briefly just share some thoughts on yesterday. I assume you're aware that there was an attempted assassination on former President Donald Trump, and I feel like that doesn't happen every day, and so I should probably share some, some thoughts and I don't really know what to say. Quite frankly, I don't have like this deep insight to give to you other than the obvious, but I can share how it impacted me. And so two feelings I felt going back to last week. I felt sadness and I felt inspired. And those are two different things on, on the spectrum and I'll, I'll explain why on each. I felt sadness because it's just sad that to see the reality of, uh, of depravity, you know? As we're gonna look at today, we, we wrestle not against flesh and blood, and when you see someone attempted to be assassinated right before your eyes, that's, that's the invisible darkness is being made visible in that moment when you try to you know, shoot someone in the head. So it's sad. It's sad also to see people lost their lives from a political rally. It's just sad. Uh, so that's, that's why I felt sadness. I also felt inspired, oddly, and the reason why is, is this. You know, Donald Trump, he's probably one of the most polarizing people had, that has ever been in, in, in probably my lifetime as far as uh, people love him and, and, and people hate him. And so you can debate on his agenda. You can debate on whether he's a good or bad person. All of that is up for debate, and rightfully so. But from yesterday, what you can't debate is his commitment. Whatever his agenda is, good or bad, whatever, but I'll tell you he's committed to it. He is all in. Because when somebody tries to shoot you in the head, in that moment, you have every right to act in self-preserving ways. But in a moment of self-preservation, he's not worried about himself. He's doubling down on his agenda. He's, he came to rally people and he's pressing into that rally. And so for me, what I take from that is that that is an image of conviction that the church should have in increasing measure. Because his conviction is for the country. He is promoting his country or his agenda above himself. But we as the people of God, that's how we are to be for the kingdom of God. We have a, a greater and higher calling. We live for God's kingdom above any, any, any country. And so we are called to live for something greater than ourselves, to show conviction for something beyond ourselves. And so in that moment, that, that should be something that inspires us to press into conviction, press into passion, and press into the pursuit that Christ gives us to seek first his kingdom and not seek first our comfort and not seek first our whatever. So those are my reflections, and let's open up in a word of prayer. Lord God, thank you for this moment, special moment where we get to gather around your word and worship you through the receiving of your word. Would you please remove from our minds any distractions, any and every distraction that is upon us right now. And please let us offer our hearts and minds as a, as a blank canvas for you to speak. We want to not just be hearers of your word, but doers of your word. And so would you please give us the grace to hear and apply that which is preached, all that we might more glorify you and live lives for the good of our neighbor. We want to we press into these things today. So please give us the grace. It's in Jesus' name, all God's people said together. Amen. 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 Ephesians 6, verse 10. And it says, finally, be strong in the Lord and in his mighty power. Put on the full armor of God so that you can take your stand against the devil's schemes. 
For our struggle is not against flesh and blood, but against the rulers, against the authorities, against the powers of this dark world, and against the spiritual forces of evil in the heavenly realms. There was a young man who was fairly athletic, and he was interested in pursuing football. He had played sports, other sports, but he was always intrigued by football, the helmets, the pads, the the tackling. He wanted to get a piece of that. So he decided he was going to go out for his high school football team. So he goes out for the team, and the young man was really surprised by how hard they trained. Everything they did, once it got uncomfortable, the coach would come and say, two more. So when they would do their wind sprints and their lungs felt like they were going to collapse and they might vomit from exhaustion, the coach would come and say, get ready for battle, two more. And when they would squat and their legs began to feel numb to where they would buckle, the coach would come by and say, get ready for battle, do two more. And this sort of thing sort of annoyed the young man because he felt like this is a game. I shouldn't have to push past levels of comfort. Well, it's the night of the first game, and it's ready for kickoff, and the young man is is sort of taking it all in, the, the, the lights and the crowd and the cheerleaders, and it's just a lot for him. And so he's running down the field as they kick off the, the, the start of the season. And as he's, as he's running, again, he's taking it all in, the grass and the, the uniforms, and in a split second, his whole world is rocked. His helmet pops off and his mouthpiece shoots out and his body flies three feet in the air and lands flat on the grass and the wind's knocked out of him. He's gasping for air. In a split second when he wasn't watching, someone from the other team, you know, blindsided him and and put him on his back. So as he gets up and said he can't breathe and he limps off the field, his coach looks at him intently. He said, I told you, get ready for battle. You better wake up. Ephesians chapter 6 is a letter written by Paul to the church of Ephesus, about 60 AD. And as he ends his letter, he's trying to make the people of God aware. He says, listen, Christian, be aware. You are in a real spiritual battle, but this battle is not against flesh and blood. In other words, it's not merely based on what you can see. It's not about people. It's not about the physical realm. There's a real, unseen, spiritual realm that you can't see, but it's having impact on you nonetheless. And you better be aware, because if you're not aware, you are likely already on your path to defeat. You better wake up. And even though this was written almost 2,000 years ago, I feel compelled to bring this text to us afresh and speak the same uh, measure of awareness to the people of God today. That Christian, be aware that you are in a real spiritual battle. And if you are unaware of this spiritual battle, you are likely already on your way to defeat. Teenagers who consider themselves Christians, be aware You are in a real spiritual battle against principalities and dark forces in the heavenly realms. And if you're not aware, you are probably on your way to defeat. Single women, single men, married couples, young adults, those who are new to the faith, those who feel like they are seasoned in the faith. Let me put you on notice. You are in a real spiritual battle against rulers and principalities and authorities in dark places. And if you are unaware of this reality, you are probably already on your way to defeat. And when I say defeat, sometimes we think, oh, that means a moral failure, this major moral failure. But that's not just what defeat means. To be ineffective in your faith is defeat as well. To be ineffective in your faith is a win for the enemy. To live the Christian life but to walk it in the flesh is a win for the enemy. To live the Christian life, but to chase the things of this world, that is defeat as well. I want you to realize the reality and the severity of what this spiritual battle means. Write down 1 Peter chapter 5, verse 8. 1 Peter 5, verse 8. Listen to what Peter says. 1 
1 Peter 5, 8, talking to the people of God, he says, be alert and of sober mind. Wake up. That's what he's saying. Be alert, of sober mind. Your enemy, the devil, crawls around like a soft, gentle, cute, and cuddly kitty cat. Is that what it says? No. Your enemy, the devil, prowls around like a roaring lion looking for someone to hug and squeeze and kiss goodnight. Is that what the scripture says? No. Looking to devour someone, to bite your head off. I'm not being dramatic. It's what the, if this is the word of God, that's what it's trying to tell you. Right now, 1 Thessalonians 5, 5 to 8. 1 Thessalonians 5, 5 to 8. Paul says again, you are children of the light and children of the day. In other words, you're Christians. You're born again. We do not belong to the night or to the darkness. So then let us not be like others who are asleep, but let us be awake and sober. For those who sleep, sleep at night, and those who get drunk, get drunk at night. Verse 8, but since we belong to the day, since we are believers, let us be sober. Let us wake up, putting on faith and love as a breastplate and the hope of salvation as a helmet. Both of these passages and many more highlight the reality that Christians need to be awake. You better put your helmet on. You better strap that helmet up. You better put that mouthpiece in. You are in a spiritual battle, and if you are not aware of this, you are probably already on your way to defeat. So why do I start today with this? Well, we've been talking about life by the Spirit and walking in the Spirit. And the reality is, if you're going to walk by the Spirit, there is a spiritual war seeking to prevent you from this very thing. The Scripture says there's a war within us, and there's a war outside of us. And both of those wars seek to prevent us from walking by the Spirit. You can write down Galatians 5.17. Galatians 5.17, the Scripture teaches us that the flesh desires what is contrary to the Spirit, and the Spirit what is contrary to the flesh. Write down Romans chapter 7. Paul talks about the war that's within him. He desires to do the right thing, but there's this inner battle within him trying to prevent him from doing the right thing. This talks about the internal war. There's this battle within you between your flesh and the spirit, your old nature, your old inclinations, and the new nature, the new person you've been made to be. There's, a, there's this internal war within us, but in Ephesians 6, we also see that there's an external war outside of us versus rulers and principalities in the dark places. We got it going on on the inside, and we got it going on the outside. And so with this foundation laid, we're going to look at uh, 1 Corinthians chapter 10, no, 2 Corinthians chapter 10, and we're going to sort of unpack the essence of spiritual war, the essence of the spiritual battle, and then we're going to provide some application. So go to 2 Corinthians chapter 10, verse, five, uh, verse 1. That's what we're going to turn to right now. 2 Corinthians chapter 10, verse 1, or write it down. It should be on the screen. Second Corinthians 10, verse 1. Are we there? All right. I'm not. Just give me a second. I was in 1 Corinthians. Okay, 2 Corinthians 10. It says, By the humility and gentleness of Christ, I appeal to you, I, Paul, who am timid when face to face with you, but bold toward you in a way. I beg you that when I come, I may not have to be as bold as I expect to be toward some people who think we live by the standards of this world. For though we live in the world, we do not wage war as the world does. The weapons we fight with are not the weapons of the world. On the contrary, they have the divine power to demolish strongholds. We demolish arguments in every pretension that sets itself up against the knowledge of God, and we take captive every thought to make it obedient to Christ. I'll pause there. So Paul, again, spiritual leader, he's writing this letter to the Corinthian church. He loves this church deeply. He founded this church, and he's going to come visit them soon. But he's telling them, when I come to visit you, I'm about to wage war. There's a real issue that's happening in this church that Paul feels the need to wage war against. There's these false apostles that have entered in and who are 
causing up dissension and causing up trouble. And Paul is so fired up. He's saying, when I get there, I'm about to take some names. And now we're going to get the essence as you skip ahead in the letter. You skip ahead to, to chapter 11, verse 2. You're going to start to see sort of what's at stake here and the, and the essence of the, the spiritual battle he's going to wage. 2 Corinthians 11, verse 2. And this should be the one in your bulletin. Paul says, I am jealous for you with a godly jealousy. I promised you one husband to Christ so that I might present you as a pure virgin to him. But I am afraid that just as Eve was deceived by the serpent's cunning, your minds may somehow be led astray from your sincere and pure devotion to Christ. Paul is jealous for them. You're you're jealous over things you love. If you're jealous for your spouse or you're jealous for your children, that jealousy is a protective emotion. You don't want them to be harmed. And so Paul is jealous for the Corinthians because they're being pulled away from Christ. And this really is the essence of spiritual warfare. We talk about spiritual warfare, a lot of, that term has a lot of loaded assumptions and loaded meanings. So we say spiritual warfare, some people think, Casting out demons or speaking in tongues or ecstatic languages and people wiggling and shaking and manifesting. And the reality is there's different degrees of spiritual warfare, different degrees of the battle. And so when you wrestle with temptation, that is spiritual warfare. That is a spiritual battle. And when you seek to break a generational sin pattern that's been in your family for years, some may call it a generational curse, that is spiritual warfare. And when you cast demons out of somebody who's been controlled and possessed by them, that is spiritual warfare. There's, there's different degrees of this spiritual battle. But listen, all of spiritual battle is aimed at the very same thing, and it's this, to pull you away from Christ. That is the point of all of it. In fact, in your notes, I want to encourage you to circle that. Paul says, I'm afraid that you might be, circle this, led astray from a sincere and pure devotion to Christ. Circle that in your bulletin. That right there is the essence of spiritual warfare. To pull you away from a sincere and pure devotion to Christ. The enemy wants to disconnect you from your source of life who is Christ. And notice, Paul sees this as a really big deal. So big, he's ready to wage war on it. So big, he's talking about breaking down strongholds and pulling out weapons. He sees being led from a sincere and pure devotion to Christ as something really serious. And the question I have for us is, is that how we see it today? Do we see devotion to Christ the same way Paul sees devotion to Christ? Do we see following Jesus? Do we see the state of someone's soul to the same degree that Paul sees it? To him, to be distracted from Christ is something to wage war against. But if I could be honest or give my opinion, in the mainstream church, we see distracted devotion to Christ as pretty normal, acceptable, not really that big of a deal. To be honest, unknowingly, we even facilitate it. Hey, family, let's gather around and entertain ourselves with content that will pull us from a sincere and pure devotion to Christ. No one would ever say that. But that's what we're proclaiming with our actions. Hey, kids, take this device that's going to pull you away from a sincere and pure devotion to Christ. Let's all enjoy music whose lyrics and content are going to pull us from a sincere and pure devotion to Christ. And this is the heart of the enemy's scheme in our culture. I think the enemy works different ways in different parts of the world. In America, one of his primary schemes is to get us to minimize devotion to Christ, to minimize the very things that are pulling us away from Christ, to say it's not that big of a deal. Oh, let's not go overboard. Oh, let's not be too rigid. And all the while, the enemy says, dance, puppets, dance. This is his scheme. In fact, go to verse 4, 2 Corinthians 11. This ain't about condemnation, by the way. It's about awareness. It's about empowerment. I don't want you to feel condemned, 
I want you to feel empowered, to be made aware, and then you do what you want with that. 2 Corinthians 11, verse 4. Paul says, For if someone comes to you and preaches a Jesus, other than the Jesus we preach, or if you receive a different spirit from the spirit you received, or a different gospel from the one you accepted, you put up with it easily enough. He's saying if somebody preaches Jesus differently, or gives a different spirit, or, or preaches a different gospel, all of those were tactics by the enemy aimed at pulling the Corinthians away from Christ. And it was working because Paul says they put up with it. That's the enemy's de- de- deception. To put up with the very things that pull you from Christ. To tolerate the very things that pull you from Christ. To facilitate, to endorse, to turn a blind eye to, to accept the very things that are pulling us from Christ. When all the while the scripture is clear, wage war on the things that pull you from Christ. No matter how common it is in society, no matter how normal it is, the scripture says, no, you wage war against that stuff because your soul is at stake. Right now, Matthew 5. Matthew 5, you've seen this verse if you've been in church for quite some time, but I want you to see it through the light of spiritual warfare. Matthew 5, verse 29. Listen to the words of Jesus. If your right eye causes you to stumble, what does he say? Gouge that bad boy out. Throw it away. Better for you to lose one part of your body than for your whole body to be thrown into hell. And if your right hand causes you to stumble, cut that thing off. Throw it away. It's better for you to lose one part of your body than for your whole body to be thrown into hell. Now, this is somewhat dramatic language, but Jesus is saying this. Wage war on the things that pull you from God. It's the essence of what he's saying. If your right eye causes you to sin, in other words, if your right eye pulls you from a sincere and pure devotion to Christ, pluck it out. If your right hand causes you to sin, in other words, if your right hand pulls you from a sincere and pure devotion to Christ, Cut that thing off. Wage war on the very things that are pulling you from a sincere and pure devotion to Christ. And if you are going to live like this, understand that you better be okay with going against the grain. You better be okay with being a little different. You better be okay with people not understanding you because most people aren't going to get it. Most people lack an awareness of the enemy schemes. So they're not going to understand your convictions. They're not going to understand the decisions that you're making, but the word of God is clear. The people of God must be aware of the enemy's schemes so that they don't fall for it. So what I want to do from this point is bring a heightened awareness to his schemes. There's three instruments. There's more than three, but there's three specific instruments that are very basic that Satan utilizes to pull us from a sincere and pure devotion to Christ. And these instruments are not inherently bad. They're actually inherently good because they were created by God. At least two of them were. They're created by God. So they're not bad, but Satan wants to leverage them, leverage the influence that they have in perverse ways to pull us from our devotion to him. And here's the first one. Write it down. is people. People. One of Satan's most basic instruments to pull you from a sincere and pure devotion to God is people. People tend to have strong influence over us because God created us as relational beings. In the garden, God said it is not good for man to be alone. So within every human being, there is this need to connect. We were created for connection, connection with God, first and foremost, and connection for people as well. And Satan understands this. He understands the need to connect and the influence that people have over us. And so he gets that, that human desire, that human need that we have, and he leverages it to pull us away from Christ by linking us to the wrong types of people or to people who have unhealthy influence over us. This was the issue in the Corinthian church. These false apostles were being leveraged by Satan to pull the Corinthians away from Christ. This was the issue with the Israelites in the promised land. If you remember that story, God specifically told the people, of Israel. When you enter the land, don't intermingle with those folk. They're going to pull you from a sincere and pure devotion to me. In fact, write down uh, Deuteronomy chapter 7, verse 1. Read it for your own self. Deuteronomy 7, verse 1. Listen to God's instructions. 
when the Lord your God brings you into the land you are entering to possess and drives out before you many nations, the Hittites, Girgashites, Amorites, Canaanites, Perizzites, Hivites, and Jebusites, seven nations larger and stronger than you, verse 3, listen, do not intermarry with them. Do not give your daughters to their sons or take their daughters for your sons, for they will, listen, turn your children away from following me to serve other gods. They will pull you from a sincere and pure devotion to God. And the Lord's anger will burn against you and you will quickly be destroyed. This is what you are to do. Break down their altars, smash their sacred stones, cut down their share poles, and burn their idols in the fire. For you are a people holy to the Lord. The Lord your God has chosen you out of all the peoples on the face of the earth to be his people, his treasured possession. Don't mix with them. They're going to pull you from a sincere devotion to God. And what did they do? Do you remember? They did the very thing God said not to do. They dwelled among the people, and it was to their spiritual demise. People can be leveraged by Satan to pull you from your devotion to Christ. It was the same issue with King Solomon, the wisest, most powerful man on the face of the earth, and yet he was influenced by people away from a sincere and pure devotion to God. Write down 1 Kings chapter 11, verses 1 to 7. 1 Kings 11, 1 to 7. King Solomon, however, loved many foreign women, Pharaoh's daughter, Moabites, Ammonites, Edomites, Sidonians, and Hittites. They were from the nations about which the Lord had told the Israelites, you must not intermarry with them because they will surely, listen, turn your hearts after their gods, pull you from a sincere and pure devotion to me. Nevertheless, Solomon held fast to them in love. He had 700 wives of royal birth and 300 concubines, which is a lower-level wife, and his wives led him astray. As Solomon grew old, his wives turned his heart after other gods. His heart was not fully devoted to the Lord his God as the heart of his father David had been. The wisest, richest man on the earth was pulled away from God by the influence of people. Church, we need to be aware. Are you more stronger than Solomon? Are you more spiritually discerning than this man? Be aware. Take heed lest you fall. People have the ability to pull us from a sincere, pure devotion to Christ. Parents, wake up on this. Peers, have the ability to pull your kids away from a sincere and pure devotion to Christ. Don't sleep on that. Please don't sleep on that. Children are extremely vulnerable. They are forming their identity. They're forming their belief system. And Satan can leverage the influence of peers to pull your kids from a sincere and pure devotion to Christ. What do you do with that? We're going to talk about that a little bit later. But I'm just trying to heighten our awareness. Don't sleep. Don't be naive. Satan can leverage people to pull us from a sincere and pure devotion devotion to Christ. Second thing to write down, instruments that Satan uses. We got people. Number two is we got pleasure. Satan can leverage, utilize pleasure to pull you from a sincere, impure devotion to Christ. Pleasure is not an inherently bad thing. God created us to pursue pleasure. It's in our DNA. And I believe God put that within humanity so that we might seek him and find it in him. But Satan has taken that human need of pleasure, that human pursuit, and he gets us to pursue pleasure, not by pursuing God, but by going away from God. That's what he has done. He gets to, he he attaches to a human need and gets, and, and, and seeks to influence you to satisfy that need going away from God instead of going to God. He wants you to chase pleasure instead of chasing God. Write down Matthew 6, verses 19 to 24. Matthew 6, 19 to 24. Scripture says, Do not store for yourselves treasures on earth, where moths and vermin destroy, and where thieves break in and steal. But store for yourselves treasures in heaven, where moths and vermin do not destroy, and thieves do not break and steal. For where your treasure is, there your heart will be also. Verse 24. No one can serve two masters. Say it again. No one can serve two masters. 
either you will hate one and love the other, or you will be, there's that word, devoted to the one and despise the other. You cannot serve both God and money. Do you believe that? Okay, write down 1 Timothy chapter 6, verse 10. 1 Timothy 6, 10. For the love of money is the root of all kinds of evil. Some people, eager for money, have wandered from their faith. They have drifted from a sincere and pure devotion to Christ and have pierced themselves with many griefs. Why use two passages about money when I'm talking about being pulled away from Christ regarding pleasure? Because money gives you the power to pursue your pleasure. That's the power of money. Money touches on two human desires, power and pleasure. We want power and we want pleasure. And money gives you the power to pursue your pleasure. And what can happen is in your pursuit of that pleasure, you draw away from Christ. You start pursuing pleasure and the benefits that money can give you instead of pursuing Christ above all things. Comfort is one of the major idols of, of our culture. We love, com- we build our lives around comfort. That's what drives our motivations and drives what we do. Well, what's underneath comfort? The love of pleasure. It's really what it is. Being comfortable feels good. It's a pleasure thing. So pleasure is not bad, but you've got to understand that Satan will leverage pleasure and get you to pull away from Christ instead of being pulled toward Christ. So that's the second instrument, very basic, that Satan uses to pull us from a sincere and pure devotion to Christ. Here's the third one. Write it down. It just so happens to start with a P as well. It's pain. Pain. Satan will leverage pain to pull you from a sincere and pure devotion to Christ. Because we are pleasure seekers by nature, we are also pain avoiders by nature. It's in our nature to avoid pain, right? We don't, we don't like pain, which is fine. But Satan wants you to attach your pain to God. Because if you attach your pain to God, you will pull away from God because you will naturally pull away from pain. This happens all the time, every day, that people are drifting from a sincere and pure devotion to Christ because of the pain that they're in. And this is the rationale that they go with. If God is good, why am I suffering? If God is good, why is this bad thing happening? If God is good, why did my loved one die? Or why does this person have a disease? Or why is this person disabled? And what they've done, they've attached the goodness of God with the pain that they're in, and they can't reconcile the two, so they say, well, away from God then. Or they begin to doubt God's goodness or doubt God's character. And this is a scheme of the enemy. He's gotten you to attach your pain to God. And in the process, you are drifting from a sincere and pure devotion to your very source of life. So there's your spiritual truth for the week. You are in a spiritual battle. Satan wants to pull you from a sincere and pure devotion to Christ. And he will do this through many things, but three specific, through people, through pain, and through pleasure. That's your theology. Great. What do we do now? What's the application for all of this? Now, talk about life in the spirit. Several weeks. There's two practices or there's two spiritual realities that I've drilled on every single week that are necessary for life in the spirit. Do you remember what they are? Awareness and what else? Surrender. Awareness and surrender. Everyone say awareness. Say surrender. Central to living the Christian life. Awareness and surrender. Central to living the Christian life. So awareness and surrender are also central to overcoming the schemes of the enemy in fighting the the spiritual battle that you are in. So awareness, what does that mean? Awareness, aware of the enemy's schemes and aware of how it's impacting you. Both. You got to be aware of the enemy's schemes but you also have to be aware of how it's being effective in your life. You have to be aware or willing to admit that these people are pulling me away from Christ. You have to be aware or willing to admit that this content that I'm digesting is pulling me away from Christ. You have to be aware or willing to admit that the kids that my kids are hanging out with are pulling me away from Christ. You have to be aware or willing to admit that this pain that I'm feeling is actually pulling me from Christ. It starts with awareness, but then it progresses to surrender got to be aware of what's going on, but then you have to surrender the battle 
to God. So, how do you surrender this battle to God? We'll find out next week. I'll tell you right now then. Four things. Since you, uh, I'll give you four things. You convinced me. No, I, I was, I was going to do it anyway. Four tools of surrender, I call them. Okay, these are practical ways that you can surrender to God. Here's the first one, removal. It might say remove on the screen, but removal. Removal is a spiritual tool available to you as an act of surrender to overcome the enemy. So, when you become aware that this thing is pulling you from a sincere and pure devotion to Christ, your first thing to consider is removal, meaning remove the very thing from your life that is pulling you from Christ. So if it's a boyfriend or girlfriend, consider removing them. If it's a habit, consider removing it. If it's a place that you tend to stumble with, remove it. If it's a relationship, remove it. And when you remove something from your life as an act of surrender, it's actually an act of worship. Because what you are declaring is this, that even though I love this very thing that I'm doing or this person, I am willing to remove it because my love for God is even greater. It's an act of surrender. It's an act of worship. And what you're doing is you're staking your claim that Christ will be central to your life. To remove something that's hurting your faith is to say, Jesus, I want you more. Even if I don't feel it, I'm declaring it that I want you more. So the question for reflection this week is, listen, are there any people, places, or pleasures that you need to consider removing from your life for the sake of your spiritual health? Any people, any pleasures, any pain, you can't really remove the pain unless it's something you're doing to yourself, but any of those things that you need to consider removing from your life for the sake of your spiritual health. Removal is a tool of surrender that we can use to overcome the enemy. Second tool, and it's connected to removal, is replacement. Replacement. Replacement is a spiritual tool of surrender that can help you when you are being pulled away from a sincere and pure devotion to Christ. Now, a lot of times in the church, Christianity, we think that it's all about just removing the bad. But it's not just about removing the bad. It's also about replacing it with the good. So when you identify that something is pulling you from Christ, you want to replace it with something that's going to pull you towards Christ. So if you remove crap music, you can replace it with good music. If you remove going to the bar, you can replace it with going to home group or going to church. So removal and replacal, re re replacement, two very basic tools that can be acts of surrender that help us come towards Christ instead of being pulled away from Christ. Third one, renewal. Renewal. Again, when you become, and this, this is one that, that's difficult to appropriate, needs accountability and great spiritual maturity, but it's something that you're going to have to do quite a bit in your life. Renewal. When you recognize that something might be pulling you from a sincere and pure devotion to Christ, you might need to renew, meaning renew your approach to that very thing. You can't always remove stuff from your life. And so your kids might go to school and you can't just remove the people that they're with. That, that, that might not be an option for you. Or food might be something that's pulling you from Christ. You can't just not eat food. You're going to die. Or money. Money might be a tool from the enemy that's pulling you. You can't just not have money. You, you, you do need money to live. That's, that's just the reality of things. And so in those situations when you can't remove something, you need to renew it, meaning renew how you view it, renew how you approach it, renew what you believe about it. And so here's an example. Food is pulling me from Christ. Okay, I'm overeating and I, it, it's killing me and I'm, I'm unhealthy and I use food as my refuge instead of Christ as my refuge. Okay, cool. I need food, but listen, food will no longer be my master. Food will no longer be what I run to for refuge. I will run to Christ because Christ is my, is, is my master. What's happening? You're renewing your mind. You're renewing your approach to this food. You're redeeming something that is good for your life. Or this person. I can't remove this person from my life, but I'm no longer going to seek my words from this person. I'm no longer going to get my affirmation or my value from this person because my affirmation and my value comes from my Heavenly Father who is God Almighty. And so what you're doing is you are now renewing. You're renewing your approach to this very thing and you are redeeming it. Or money. 
Yeah, I, I chase money because it's the center of my life, but money will, will no longer be what I chase. Now I'm going to use money as a tool to pursue Christ, who is my God. You're renewing your approach to these things. And so you can't always, re- you, 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 pain falls into this category. You can't always just remove pain, but what you might need to do is renew your mind with the pain that you're in. You might need to renew your mind according to James chapter 1, verses 2 to 4. It says, consider it pure joy, my brothers, when you face many kind of trials. Consider it pure joy when you're in pain. How? Well, the testing of your faith produces perseverance. Perseverance must continue its work so that you might be mature and complete, not lacking anything. I'm going to feel this pain, and instead of it pulling me from Christ, I'm going to let it pull me towards Christ. An opportunity for growth, an opportunity to see him as my refuge. You might need to renew your mind regarding pain according to 2 Corinthians chapter 4, verses 16 and 17. I might be wrong on that. But it says our light and momentary troubles, pain, are achieving for us an eternal glory that far outweighs them all. So we fix our eyes not on what we can see, but what is unseen. For what is seen is temporary, but what is unseen is eternal. This very pain that I'm in is actually, by God's grace, if I allow him to be God of my life in this, it's achieving for me an eternal glory. I'm going to be blessed in all of eternity as I persevere and grab hold of Christ in the midst of this pain. And so for you, another question to reflect upon this week is this. Is there any people pleasures or pain in my life that I need to renew my mind with for the sake of my spiritual health. Maybe I'm not going to remove it from my life, but I might need to renew it, renew my approach to it, redeem that thing. Tools of surrender. We have, what was the first one? Removal. Say remove. What was the second one? Say replace. Oh, you already did. So (laughs) remove, replace. What was the third one? Renewal. Here's the fourth one is revisit. Write it down. Revisit. This is another one that you're going to have to practice. It takes spiritual maturity and probably community to help you appropriate. But when you are aware that something is pulling you from a sincere and pure devotion to Christ, you might need to consider revisiting it, meaning distancing yourself from it, putting a healthy boundary in place until you can handle it in a more healthy fashion. Not everything is bad, but sometimes we're not ready for something. So you might have a relationship that's leading you into sin that you're not ready for. Doesn't mean you'll never have a relationship, but it does mean you might need to revisit this. You might need to put it aside, have some distance, allow God to produce more maturity in you, more health in you, and you revisit it at another time. There might be an opportunity coming up that you're excited about, but you're not really ready for it. You're not healthy enough. Does that mean it's never going to happen? No. You might need to put it aside, get healthy, mature, and then revisit it at a later time. Something that's bringing you harm right now might bring you health in the future if you would remove yourself from it, grow, allow God to work on you, and pick it up at a future time. I think many things in life that we remove, it's not necessarily have to be forever. It might just be for a time, for our spiritual maturity and for our spiritual growth. So you might need to say, you know what, my phone, my phone is, this app on my phone is not edifying me right now. I need to get off it, give it six months, and then maybe pick it back up when I can handle it in a more healthy fashion. So another question for you to reflect upon is this, are there any people, pleasures, practices that you need to revisit. Consider putting aside for a season so that you can get healthy, so that you can mature and grow and revisit it, re-pick it up at a future time. And so before we close, I want to I recap. Christian, listen. I said it aggressively earlier, so I'll say it gently now. Hopefully one of the two register. You're in a spiritual battle. For real. If this is true. You're in a spiritual battle. It's not based on what you can see. It's largely happening on what you can't see. And the enemy of your soul wants to pull you away from a sincere and pure devotion to Christ. And he will leverage lots of things, but three very basic ones. He'll leverage pain. He'll leverage pleasure. He'll leverage people to try to pull you away from a sincere and pure devotion to Christ. And you need to be aware of these things. You need to be aware of how it's impacting you. And then you need to surrender these things to God. And you can do them in four ways. There's more than four, but four very basic ways. 
You can do it through removing things in your life, replacing things in your life, renewing your approach to things in your life, and revisiting things in your life. And so here's the way to make this very applicable now. It's three homeworks I have for you. Soul work, if you want to call it that. The first one is this. In your quiet time, reflect upon this question. Ask God to reveal to you. Ask God to reveal to you. Is there anything in my life leading me away from a sincere and pure devotion to Christ? You got to ask that. You got to have some courage to let God reveal it to you. Is there anything in my life pulling me away from a sincere and pure devotion to Christ? Reflect upon that. Ten minutes. You can ask God to tell you, and you can just sit in silence for ten minutes. Don't say anything. Just sit. See the different things that come to your mind. Give God room to operate. Give God room to perform the soul surgery that you need to have, that we all need to have. So is there anything in my life that's pulling me away from a sincere and pure devotion to Christ? Second thing to reflect upon, once God reveals it, surrender it. So what tool of surrender might I need to activate to combat this? Do I need to remove this from my life? Do I need to replace it? Do I need to renew my approach to it? Do I need to revisit it? But really ask God to reveal that to you. What is pulling me away, if anything? What do I need to, what act of surrender do I need to do? Okay, those are your two things to do on your own. And then the third one is to do with someone else. I want you to discuss this with one other person in the church. It can be your spouse, it can be a friend, it can be some. But you need to, we need as a body of believers to really start processing in community. I believe there's only a certain level of spiritual maturity that you can achieve or you can, got, that you can become on your own. You were created for connection, and that involves growing in spiritual maturity as well. And so these are intimate questions. I understand that. But if there's no one in the church that you can discuss this with, you probably need to pursue deeper levels of connection and start working toward that. And that's going to take some time. Fine. But you want to be on the road towards that. So I want to encourage you to share this, discuss this, ask someone else this very thing, and have a five- or ten-minute discussion about it. And as you do, as you process in community, God provides his grace for each of you to be edifying each other and growing in his grace. And So are are there any people, pleasures, pain that's pulling you from Christ? Do you need to remove, replace, renew, or revisit anything? And then process it in community. And if we would commit to these things, now the sermon isn't just a fun, cool 45 to 50 minute time that we had, but now it's an avenue for transformation that we might grow up into the very people, the very men and women that God created us to be. Amen? Amen. Amen. Let's, let's pursue these things this week. Amen. So you got your soul work for the week. Again, I want to encourage you to, to press into it. Let it be something that forms and shapes and strengthens your soul as you reflect upon these things. Surrender them to God and then process it in community. Again, if you're new here, so glad you're here. Stop by the welcome booth. We'd love to connect with you. If you need prayer for anything, our prayer team will be here. They'd love to encourage you and pray with you. And again, press into these things, and, 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 and we're going we're gonna to keep getting deeper and deeper into what it means to, to walk by faith and specifically walk in the Spirit.